So let's see how we can go ahead and render this in Blender. Now, I'm not going to use our low poly here, but you're more than welcome to if you want. I think it's going to be a little bit nicer though if we go ahead and use our high poly here. So when setting up a render, the first thing that I like to do is just position my camera and get that set up so that I can see how everything is going to interact and understand how I want to go ahead and angle my lights. So let's go ahead and add a camera object. And I'll hit zero on my numpad to go into camera view. Alternatively, you could come up to view, down to cameras, and active camera. And then I'll hit N on my keyboard and go to view so that we can lock the camera to the view here. So now when I go and orbit around and you know move around in my scene, the camera is actually going to move with it. So it's just a lot easier to manipulate the camera this way. So now we can go into the camera properties and I want to set this up to maybe a focal length of maybe 60 just to kind of flatten things out a little bit. And we can try and just position this. Now I think I'm going to come to the, uh, I guess the right side of our asset here. And the next thing that I like to do is just to kind of get some safe areas for this camera because sometimes when we render it, something could be cut off or maybe some post effects that we have isn't applied. Uh, exactly to the entire thing and you know we want to make sure that we're not getting super close to the edges of our camera here for our render. So we have this safe areas option and by default you can see that we've got like margins for titles or the action which is what's going on in our piece here um, and we don't really need to play around with these. I think the general safe area is pretty good just so that we can kind of keep this ideally within a reasonable view of our camera here without being kind of on the outskirts. So now I'm going to just release our view from the camera here so that I'm not accidentally moving uh, my camera around now and I can actually move freely in our 3D here. And let's go ahead and set up a couple lights. So the first one that I like to set up is going to be just kind of our key light. It's going to be kind of uh, the one that's most predominant in our scene or at least across our asset. And I'm going to use a directional light, or in Blender, it's called a sunlight. So if we go to lights here, you'll see we have sun. And if you click on the wrong one, you can just go ahead and change it up here. And you'll see that we can move this around, but it's not going to do anything. We can go ahead and rotate it, and it's not going to do anything. And that's because we are in Material Preview. Now we could go ahead into the Rendered Viewport. And here you'll notice now if I start to move stuff around, um, it's going to actually reflect on our asset. But we're going to get this just kind of default gray environmental texture. And if you have HDRIs that you want to use, chances are you're probably already somewhat familiar with how to go about setting that up. But we aren't going to be using any external HDRI images. And instead, we're just going to be used what Blender has built in. So I'm going to come back to Material Preview but we're not going to get the lights right in our scene here. So if I go up to our shading properties, you'll see that under lighting, I can actually opt in to use the lights from our scene, our 3D here, and you see that maybe just a little bit of the light intensity just kind of grew. So now when I rotate this around, hopefully you can kind of see a little bit of light going on. Um, and it's not going to do anything when I move, right? And because directional light isn't position based, but it rather it's rotation based. So we can think of it as just kind of like one large sunlight kind of around our scene. I'm going to bring the intensity up to something like maybe five so that we're going to be able to see this a little bit crisper. And I'll hit zero to go back to my camera here so that I can go ahead and just maybe rotate this to kind of maybe get a bit of a grazing angle. I can maybe rotate this on the Z. If I wanted to like move the sun lamp around. I think I'll probably kind of have it coming from this angle here. So this is going to be an okay start, but we're going to be using other lights in a kind of traditional three point lighting system. And the next one I'm going to use is going to be for some rim lighting. So this time I'm going to go and add an area light and you'll notice that it's just kind of like a plane, right? And if I bring this up, actually, we'll see that as it intersects with our mesh, um, it's actually going to, light it from you know wherever downwards or however I go ahead and rotate this. 
So this is kind of a cool light because it gives a lot of more directed and controllable light just from where it's being emitted. And what's cool about this light is that obviously it's positional and rotationally uh, based. And I can actually make the whole process even easier so I don't have to go over here uh, and then rotate it or then I move it over here and then rotate it this way. And instead I can just move it around and it's going to automatically rotate. So let's go and add an empty object and I'm going to add, uh, let's just add one with arrows so it's very visible in our scene here. And back on my area light, let's go ahead and add a constraint. Now you may or may not have a little bit of experience with constraints, but constraints are really just a way for us to define relationships between objects. So if we go and add a constraint, you'll see that under tracking, I'm going to want to use a damped track. And then maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense just on its name alone, but if we look at the tooltip, it's going to point towards a target by performing the smallest rotation necessary. So the second part is not really super important other than obviously telling us that it's going to rotate with you know, the smallest rotation required. But the first part is telling us that this is going to allow us to point this asset towards a target. And we're not going to have to really worry about anything beyond that. So I'll select damped track and let's go and select this empty. So now you can see that it's moved or rotated, but it's actually pointing the wrong direction. And so this takes a little bit of playing around with uh, because you can see it's going to actually point in a bunch of different directions. And it looks like Z is pretty close if we look at the relationship lines, this blue line here. However, it's actually in the wrong direction. So let's go ahead and just make this negative Z. And now you can see that as I move this around, it's going to aim and point at the empty that we've created. And if I go ahead and move this empty up, it's also going to point there. So I'm going to move this up to maybe kind of like just underneath our seat there. And let's go and just move this kind of back over here. And I'm going to go back into my camera view. And now in the light source for our area, let's bring this up to something like, uh, well, let's try a thousand to start off. And so we'll see that it's given us a ton of uh, this rim light. Now it's maybe a little too harsh. So let's bring this down to like 500. Actually, maybe that's even a while. Let's try 100. And yeah, that's going to be okay for now. So we've got these two lighting systems set up, but we don't really have any kind of idea what our environment lighting is like. And that's the whole reason I'm using this material preview mode is we're going to use and harness Blender's built-in HDRIs. So if I come back up to shading, you'll see that we're using this one right here. And as I bring this around, right, it's actually going to alter the lighting because if we take a look, this is actually the light that's in the scene. So now I don't want to actually have that visible. You might want to have it just, you know, slightly visible so that you get some kind of, you know, cool muted background, but not the look I'm going for necessarily. So I'll bring that all the way down. We can also go ahead and play with the strength of it here, which is really cool, right? If maybe you just wanted it to be just kind of slightly lower, like maybe 0.35, right? So it's contributing, contributing a little bit of light, but not a ton. And then we can leave our, you know, lights in the scene to kind of do more of the light work. Now, maybe I'll bring this up to like 250, right? And we can see as I maybe move this around, it's going to add some rim lights to a couple areas. And that's going to look really cool. So now that I've got a couple lights and such set up in my scene here, maybe I realize, oh, you know what? Uh, this angle doesn't look too good. Maybe I want to kind of bring the camera in a little bit and get a little creative with how I'm viewing this. So we can just very easily set our camera to lock to the view. Maybe bring this up and get a little bit more of an over the top shot. So it doesn't really matter if, you know, things are kind of cut off. We want to get nice and close. So we can get rid of that. I'm also going to select our sun lamp here. Maybe just rotate that on the Z a little bit more. So we can kind of capture some of the shadows cascading across. I'm also maybe going to bring our intensity back up. I don't think that 0.35 is quite it. Let's do around 0.5. So that we can kind of fill in some of those shadows there. And let's just kind of continue to play around with this area here. 
And so I think something like that's going to look okay, as we're going to get a nice kind of close in tight shot. I'm also going to go ahead and maybe change our HDRI to be a little bit more, kind of more varied in its light sources. So I'm going to select this guy here, which is going to give us kind of these cooler colors, but a lot of different light sources as well. And I think overall, it's just going to fit the tone and the colors of this asset much better. Once I'm satisfied and happy with the colors, then we can start taking a look now at some post processing effects and where we can actually tackle those is going to be up here in this little tab with our render properties. And we're going to have a bunch of different stuff we can play with. And the first one I'm going to select is going to be ambient occlusion. And you'll notice that uh, it's a little harsh in areas, certainly in here, right? It's very, very dark. So we can go ahead and maybe peel that factor down to something like 0.5 to start, right? So it's just a more subtle effect. We don't want it to be so dark that it's just pure black. I mean, honestly, we could probably even go lower than 0.5. Let's try point, uh, let's try 0.35. Something that's a little light, right? Again, here's the difference between the two. And I'm also going to turn on Bloom. And you'll see Bloom is probably one we've seen in a lot of different applications. And it's one that uh, can very easily blow things right out of proportion and make things look uh, immediately terrible because everything is just airbrushed almost. So let's go ahead and just bring the uh, threshold for this guy up a little bit. So it's at 0.8 by default. Let's try 1.5. And let's bring the radius down as well. So that things can kind of have a little bit of a sharp, you know, glare to it, but it's not going to just fly off the asset and just, you know, paint our entire render. We can also go ahead and give a different color to this glare if, you know, for whatever reason you maybe wanted to uh, paint it a little bit warmer. Actually, I don't mind doing that. We can give it a bit of a, you know, orangish, yellowy kind of color to it. I think that looks pretty cool. Actually, I'm maybe going to go and just make it a little bit more uh, orange. We can also turn on screen space reflections. And this one is pretty neat because any of the glossier areas that we have on our material here is right now reflecting environmental information, AKA our HDRI, right? Our high dynamic image that is lighting this scene here. But it's not really taking into consideration any of the other actual pieces or assets, right? But when I go ahead and turn this on, you might notice now like in here, right? It's now actually starting to kind of reflect these other pieces. So you're just going to add a little bit more to the realism of this particular piece because now it's actually going, hey, okay, I know that I have to reflect some more information. And now we can go ahead and play around with the trace precision and the roughness to really get more uh, higher quality shots out of these pieces. But I'll let you go and play around with that and really start to get a feel for it because it can also kind of have a bit of a negative impact on the performance. And when I'm recording, maybe not the most ideal time to have the biggest impact to your performance. The next thing we can take a look at is actually under the shadows tab here. And it's not something that's always, you know, the most interesting or the first thing to be thought of when talking about render quality, but shadows are just as equally important as the light settings, right? Because if your light looks good, but your shadows look pretty crap, well, you've really only done half the job there, right? So what we can do is give our shadows a higher bit depth for tonality. We can also change the cascade and the cube size to be a little higher resolution. Oftentimes I'll change the cube size up to be 1024 and the cascade size to be 2K. And it's just gonna give you higher quality shadows all around. And once I'm satisfied with the shadows, I generally come down to film just briefly because I want to actually set the background to be transparent. So when I can go ahead and render this out, it's going to render with a transparent background that then I could maybe go ahead and, you know, create a background in Photoshop or something to slap this render onto. So we can go ahead and change that here. Now it's not going to actually show up until we go and render, but if we're in our rendered preview, you can see, right, I can change the background to be transparent. And really that's what it's going to do. It's just going to render out our asset here with the transparent background. 
And finally, what I'm going to take a look at is under color management. And this is where we get to have a little bit of fun with just the colors that we have in this shot so far. So by default, it's going to be filmic view transform. I'm going to leave that because it gives a very good and clear quality color space. But I'm going to change the look from none to be high contrast or medium high contrast, I should say. It's going to add a little bit of color, a little bit of pop and some clarity or sharpness to it, which is going to really just kind of let it, at least I find, kind of leap off the screen. We can also go ahead if you like to manipulate curves and use curves down here to possibly change either the entire look or you can go ahead and change individual channels like maybe you wanted to bring the red value up just a little bit in various areas. Now I don't really want to bring the red up. We can maybe go ahead and select C here which is going to be all our channels. Maybe bring you know the darker values down. Maybe a little too much bring it down kind of over here. Bring some brighter values up. Again, just a very gentle S curve, which is a very common color grading tactic used. But you can get really creative with how you're using these curves to give this render entirely different looks. And finally, back up at the top, we have this sampling tab, which has render and viewport, as well as viewport denoising. And so we're going to want to leave that on because it's going to help us, you know, see higher quality for a lot less samples. And what these numbers are indicating is basically the number of iterations or samples or times it goes through and processes all of the lights and all of the pixels that make up our final render. Now, we'll see that the render is a little bit higher than the viewport, and that's because viewport is actually indicative of, if I just make sure our camera's not on there, right? Every single motion and movement I do, it's giving it 16 passes or 16 iterations. And so it might not be as high quality in the viewport as it would be in a final render. However, we aren't actually going to go up to render and render an image, but instead we're going to do a viewport render. So the difference is, like I've said, we're working in the material preview. So this is kind of just more focused on the viewport rather than final renders. Whereas if we were to go ahead and render out here in our rendered view, this would be an area where we'd have to go up, select render and render image. However, because we're using some built in HDRIs and I didn't want to go through the process of having to set them up in our rendered view, just because realistically it's a lot more effort than is required because we can do it a much simpler way. We aren't really going to be focusing too much on this render tab here, but instead we're going to be focusing on this viewport. And you'll notice that if I bring this up to 64, just like our render, it's actually going to recalculate our viewport here. And now I've given it more samples to iterate through, and ideally it's going to be a lot better than 16. Now, at the end of the day, there really isn't a huge difference. Let's say I brought this down to something like one, right? We've only given it one pass, and we can see a lot of different, you know, kind of noisy pixel information that doesn't look good. So we can bring this up to something like, I don't know, 150 maybe, give it a ton of different samples, allow it to you know, iterate and cycle through or sample through the areas where we're maybe doing some screen space reflection to really clean up those reflection values. So once you've set the viewport to a samples that you're happy with, and again, it's not going to really need to be that high, how we can go about rendering this out very quickly and exactly what we see here is I can just go up to view down to viewport render image and very quickly we're going to get a very high quality render that is exactly what we had seen in our viewport now say we wanted to change the resolution right because we didn't really look at the actual size of the output rendered image so i can come into our output properties here with the little uh, i guess it's a printer printing something out and this is where we're going to be able to change the resolution. So I can change the X resolution. I can change the Y resolution. Um, it's a little kind of you know weird to look at because it doesn't really, you know, I'm changing the X and it's changing the Y, but because it's aspect related, right? So we're kind of actually changing the aspect overall as I go ahead and increase the amount of X. We are actually making it bigger, right? We're adding more to the X, 
um, but it's actually making the aspect of it longer or wider. And when I first got into Blender a hundred years ago, it actually took me a long time to really understand what was happening because I could go ahead and, you know, really crank up the X, but it wasn't making the X bigger, right? So that's kind of a little bit of a goofy thing that might be a kind of counterintuitive at the start. But the best way to go is just to go with what's kind of standardized image formats. And if you don't really know what a good image format is, just Google it really. You'll get a ton of different aspect ratios and pixel sizes for what makes good looking images. So what I'm going to do is just going to do 1920 by 1080, which it was at default and which is the size, you know, of or at least the ratio of most computer screens nowadays. And we can actually set the percentage here. And the percentage is just going to be a percentage resolution of this. So I could set this to say 50%. And realistically, what it's going to render at is half this resolution. So if you know that you want like a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, and you know that 1920 by 1080 is exactly that, you don't have to go ahead and try and figure out, okay, what is half of 1920 by 1080, or what is two times 1920 by 1080. Say you want to upscale the resolution of your final output, right? Well, what we can do is actually set this to 200%, and that's the equivalent of setting these to, you know, two times whatever 1920 is and whatever 1080 is. So it kind of does the math for us, which is really, really handy. So now when I go ahead and go to view, viewport render anim uh, image, not animation, it's now going to render out our 1080, uh, 1920 by 1080 at two times the resolution or two times the scale or size. So it's going to take a little bit longer, but once it finally does render, we are going to be very happy at how high quality this final render is.